Now, I want to share a story with you, and this is actually an article that I wrote over the weekend called All Wars Are Bankers' Wars. And I went in, I did a lot of research, it's posted to the front page of whatreallyhappened.com. I understand it's already gone viral, it's being reposted around the web. Uh, but I wanted to basically tell it to you here on the radio show. And it's a very long story, we're probably going to take the rest of the hour to do it. But it's something that you need to understand, that all of these wars and assassinations that we're told are crazed loan nut assassins, or w weapons of mass destruction, or bringing democracy, all of them track back to the private central bankers as the initiating event. And the more you study this, the more you will realize all the wars are wars for the bankers, for the private central bankers. And I know a lot of people are going to have difficulty comprehending this, just how many of these wars we have fought as a nation were fought for no other purpose than to force private central banks onto nations that did not want them. So we're going to have a few examples so you understand why at this particular time in history the United States government is mired in so many wars against so many foreign nations. And there's plenty of precedents for this. Now, Going back to the beginning, the United States fought the American Revolution primarily over King George III's Currency Act, which forced the colonists to abandon their own government-issued currencies and conduct business only using printed banknotes borrowed at interest from the Bank of England. If you go back to the writings of Ben Franklin, direct quote, the refusal of King George III to allow the colonies to operate an honest money system which freed the ordinary man from the clutches of the money manipulators was probably the prime cause of the revolution. That's Ben Franklin. Now our public schools don't teach that because you're not supposed to know that the bankers were really behind the American Revolution. After the revolution, the United States adopted a revolutionary, radically different economic system in which the government issued its own value-based currency so that private banks couldn't skim the wealth of the people through interest-bearing banknotes. So the American Revolution was fought primarily to free the American people from King George III's Currency Act, which ordered them to conduct all business using printed banknotes borrowed at interest from the Bank of England. So the Bank of England was just, you know, raking in wealth from the labor of the American people in exchange for ink and paper. And that fueled the anger that led to the American Revolution. Your public schools don't spend a lot of time on that, but that was really what it was all about. So the revolution was over, the United States was born, but the private bankers are nothing if not dedicated to their schemes to acquire other people's wealth, and they knew full well how easy it is to corrupt a nation's leaders. Now, just one year after Mayor Amschel Rothschild had uttered his infamous let me issue and control a nation's money and I care not who makes the laws, private bankers succeeded in setting up a new private central bank called the First Bank of the United States, largely through the efforts of the Rothschild's chief supporter in the United States, Alexander Hamilton. Now, this First Bank of the United States was founded in 1791, and by the end of its 20-year charter, the First Bank of the United States had almost ruined the nation's economy while enriching the bank's owners. As a result, Congress refused to renew the charter and signaled their intention to go back to a state-issued value-based currency on which the people paid no interest at all to any banker. This resulted in a threat from Nathan Mayer Rothschild against the U.S. government. Quote, either the application for renewal of the charter is granted or the United States will find itself involved in a most disastrous war. End quote. Congress still refused to renew the charter for the First Bank of the United States, whereupon Nathan Mayer Rothschild railed, quote, teach those impudent Americans a lesson, bring them back to colonial status, end quote. Financed by the Rothschild Control Bank of England, Britain then launched the War of 1812 to recolonize the United States and force them back into the slavery of the Bank of England's banknotes or to plunge the United States into so much debt they would, have, they would be forced to accept a new private central bank. And the plan worked. Even though the United States won the War of 1812, Congress was forced to grant a new charter for yet another private bank, issuing the public currency as loans at interest, the second bank of the United States. Once again, private bankers were in control of the nation's money supplied and cared not who made the laws or how many British or American soldiers had to die for it. So once again, the nation was plunged into debt, unemployment, poverty by the predations of the private central bank. And in 1832, Andrew Jackson successfully campaigned for his second term as president under the slogan, Jackson and no bank. True to his word, Jackson succeeded in blocking the renewal of the charter for the Second Bank of the United States of America. And this was where that famous quote came from Andrew Jackson. Quote, gentlemen, I too have been a close observer of the doings of the Bank of the United States. 
I have had men watching you for a long time, and I am convinced that you've used the funds of the banks to speculate in the breadstuffs of the country. When you won, you divided the profits amongst you, and when you lost, you charged it to the bank. You tell me that if I take the deposits from the bank and annul the charter, I shall ruin 10,000 families. That may be true, gentlemen, but that is your sin. Should I let you go on, you will ruin 50,000 families, and that would be my sin. You are a den of vipers and thieves. I've determined to rout you out, and by the eternal God, I will rout you out. End quote. Andrew Jackson. Shortly after the charter for the Second Bank of the United States expired, there was an assassination attempt on Andrew Jackson, and it failed when both pistols used by the assassin, Richard Lawrence, failed to fire. Later on, Lawrence explained the motive for the assassination by saying that with President Jackson dead, money would be more plenty. So it was an assassination motivated by the interests of the bankers. Now, our public school system is as subservient to the bankers' wishes to keep certain history from you, just as the corporate media is subservient to Monsanto's wishes to keep the dangers of GMOs from you and the global warming cult's wishes to conceal from you the fact that Earth has actually been cooling for the last 16 years. So it should probably be no surprise that the financial dimension of the Civil War are not well known to the average American. It's portrayed in our history books and our popular media as an internal dispute over slavery. But in fact, it was a war with global implications. When the Confederacy seceded from the United States, the bankers once again saw the opportunity for a rich harvest of debt and offered to fund Lincoln's efforts to bring the South back into the Union at 30% interest. Lincoln remarked that he would not free the black man by enslaving the white man to the bankers and using his authority as president, issued a new government currency, the greenback. This was a direct threat to the wealth and power of the central bankers who quickly responded. This is a quote from the London Times following Lincoln's issuance of the greenbacks. Quote, if this mischievous financial policy, which has its origin in North America, shall become indurated down to a fixture, then that government will furnish its own money without cost. It will pay off debts and be without debt. It will have all the money necessary to carry on its commerce. It will become prosperous without precedent in the history of the world. The brains and wealth of all countries will go to North America. That country must be destroyed, or it will destroy every monarchy on the globe. So, goaded by the private bankers, much of Europe supported the Confederacy against the Union with the expectation that victory over Lincoln would mean the end of the greenback. France and Britain seriously considered an outright invasion on the United States in support of the Confederacy, but they were held at bay by Russia. A little bit of history most Americans don't understand. Russia came to the aid of Lincoln's Union during this crisis. Now, at that time, Russia had just ended their serfdom system, and they had a state central bank similar to the system the United States had been founded on. Now, free of European intervention, the Union won the war, and Lincoln announced his intention to go on issuing the greenbacks. Following Lincoln's assassination, the greenbacks were pulled from circulation and the American people forced to go back to an economy based on banknotes borrowed at interest from the private bankers. So finally, in 1913, the private central bankers of Europe, in particular the Rothschilds of Great Britain, the Warburgs of Germany, met with their American financial collaborators on Jekyll Island, Georgia, to form a new banking cartel with the express purpose of forming the third bank of the United States, with the aim of placing complete control of the United States money supply once again under the control of private bankers. Owing to hostility over the previous banks of the United States, the name of this third bank was changed to the Federal Reserve in order to grant the new bank a quasi-governmental image. But in fact, it is a privately owned bank. It's no more federal than Federal Express. In fact, last year, the Federal Reserve successfully rebuffed a freedom of information lawsuit by Bloomberg News on the grounds that as a private banking corporation and not actually a part of the U.S. government, the Freedom of Information Act did not apply to the operators of the Federal Reserve. So 1913 proved to be a transformative year for the nation's economy. First, with Congress' passage of the 16th Income Tax Amendment and the false claim it had been ratified. Here's another direct quote. I think if you were to go back and try and find and review the ratification for the 16th Amendment, which was the internal revenue, the income tax, I think if you went back and examined that carefully, you would find that a sufficient number of states never ratified that amendment, end quote. That's U.S. District Court Judge James C. Fox in Sullivan versus United States, 2003. Later that same year, 1913, 
<clears throat> and apparently unwilling to risk another questionable amendment, Congress passed the Federal Reserve Act over the Christmas holiday in 1913, while members of Congress opposed to the measure were at home. This was a very underhanded deal, as the Constitution explicitly vests Congress with the authority to issue the public currency, does not authorize its delegation, and thus would have required a new amendment to transfer that authority to a private bank. But pass it, Congress did, and President Woodrow Wilson signed it as he promised the bankers he would in exchange for generous campaign contributions. Now, President Wilson later regretted that decision. You've probably heard this quote before, but you're going to get it again. Quote, I am a most unhappy man. I have unwittingly ruined my country. A great industrial nation is now controlled by its system of credit. We are no longer a government by free opinion, no longer a government by conviction and the vote of the majority, but a government by the opinion and duress of a small group of dominant men. That was Woodrow Wilson writing in 1919. Now, one year after the passage of the Federal Reserve Act, World War I started, and it is important to remember that prior to the creation of the Federal Reserve, there was no such thing as a world war. Now, World War I actually started between Austria, Hungary, and Serbia, but quickly shifted to focus on Germany. Why Germany? They didn't start the war. Why was Germany the villain in World War I? Well, the real reason was their industrial capacity was seen as an economic threat to Great Britain. Great Britain's pound was already in decline at the time because too much economic emphasis was on banking and finance and not enough was uh, on agricultural development, industrial development, and infrastructure. It's very much like the situation we have in the United States right now. All the financial operatives, they want to play the Wall Street games, and other parts of the economy are being neglected. We've lost a great deal of our manufacturing. Our, we're not the agricultural exporter we used to be because everybody's over there at Wall Street playing in that giant open-air casino. Now, pre-war Germany did have a private central bank, but it was under strict control by the German government to keep inflation at reasonable levels and to make sure that all of the German economy was being properly funded, just like Putin did with their, state, uh, their, uh, pri their central bank uh, about a month ago. Under government control by the German government, investment was guaranteed to internal economic development, and as a result, Germany had become a major manufacturing technological power. They were exporting products that Great Britain could not compete with. So in the media of the day, Germany was portrayed as the main opponent of World War I. And not just defeated, it was flattened. Now, following the Treaty of Versailles, Germany was ordered to pay the war costs of all the participating nations, even though Germany had not started that war. This amounted to three times the value of all of Germany itself. Germany's private central bank, to which German, the German government had gone deeply into debt to pay the cost of the wars, was allowed to break free of government control. That led to the massive inflation of the Weimar Republic, followed uh, you know, permanently uh, trapping the German people in endless debt. And money speculators were running rampant. And it led to these situations where you had literally a whole basket full of paper notes to get a loaf of bread. Now, when the Weimar Republic collapsed economically, it opened the door for the National Socialists to take power. Their first financial move was to issue their own state currency, which was not borrowed from private central banks. It was based on a unit of value, not a unit of debt. Freed from having to pay interest on the money in circulation, Germany blossomed and quickly began to rebuild its industry. It was an amazing transformation to see. The media called it the German miracle. Time magazine lionized Hitler for the amazing improvement of life for the German people and the explosion of German industry, and they even named him Time magazine's Man of the Year in 1938. And then once again, Germany's prosperity and freedom from a private central bank loaning the public currency at interest became a threat to other nations and other powers. I have a couple of quotes here from Winston Churchill that tells you what was really going through the minds of Europe in the years leading up to World War II. Quote, should Germany merchandise again, which means do business, should Germany merchandise again in the next 50 years, we have led this war, World War I, in vain. That was Winston Churchill writing in the Times in 1919. Another quote, quote, we will force this war upon Hitler if he wants it or not, end quote. Winston Churchill in a 1936 radio broadcast. Quote, Germany becomes too powerful. We have to crush it. 
end quote. Winston Churchill in uh, November 1936 speaking to U.S. General Robert Wood. Quote, this war is an English war, and its goal is the destruction of Germany. Winston Churchill, autumn 1939 broadcast. So it was all about economics and profitability. Now, Germany's state-issued value-based currency was also a direct threat to the wealth and power of the private central banks around the world. And as early as 1933, they started to organize a global boycott against Germany to strangle this upstart ruler, who thought he could run his nation without a private central bank. Now, as had been the case in World War I, Great Britain and other nations threatened by Germany's economic power looked for an excuse to go to war. And as public anger in Germany grew over the boycott, Hitler foolishly gave them that excuse. Years later, in a spirit of candor, the real reasons for the war were made clear. Quote, The war wasn't only about abolishing fascism, but to conquer sales markets. We could have, if we had intended so, prevented this war from breaking out without doing one shot, but we didn't want to. End quote. Winston Churchill to Harry Truman, March 1946. One more quote here. Quote, Germany's unforgivable crime before World War II was its attempt to loosen its economy out of the world trade system and to build up an independent exchange system from which the world finance couldn't profit anymore. We butchered the wrong pig, end quote. Winston Churchill writing in his book, The Second World War. Now, a little side note. We're going to actually step back in time to the years before World War II. A little bit of history a lot of Americans are still completely unaware of. And it involves a gentleman by the name of Marine Corps Major General Smedley Butler. In 1933, Wall Street bankers and financiers had bankrolled the successful rise to power of Hitler and Mussolini. Brown Brothers Harriman in New York, and they're still there. I saw them when I was there for the 9-11 anniversary. They were financing Hitler right up to the day war was declared with Germany. And these Wall Street financiers decided that a fascist dictatorship in the United States, based on the one Mussolini had in Italy, was going to be far better for their business interests than Roosevelt's New Deal, which threatened massive wealth redistribution to recapitalize the working and middle classes of America. So the Wall Street tycoons recruited General Butler to lead the overthrow of the U.S. government and install a Secretary of General Affairs who would be answerable to Wall Street and not the people, would crush social unrest and shut down all the labor unions. General Butler pretended to go along with the scheme, but then exposed the plot to Congress. So they recruited Major General, Marine Corps Major General Smedley Butler, to lead this coup d'etat, because Butler was very popular with uh, the soldiers, and uh, his image as part of this move would help convince the military this was the right thing to do. Now, to his credit, Major General Smedley Butler, remembering his oath to the Constitution, pretended to go along with the scheme, but then exposed the plot to the United States Congress. Congress, then as now in the pocket of Wall Street bankers, refused to act. When Roosevelt learned of the planned coup, he demanded the arrest of the plotters, but the plotters simply reminded Roosevelt that if any one of them were sent to prison, their friends on Wall Street would deliberately collapse the still fragile U.S. economy and blame Roosevelt for it. So Roosevelt was unable to do anything about this attempted coup d'etat until the start of World War II, at which time he prosecuted many of the plotters under the Trading with the Enemy Act. Now, mostly it was glossed over. It was just a rumor, unfounded. It's wacko conspiracy theory. But in 1967, the congressional minutes of Smedley Butler's revelation to Congress of the coup were, were finally released to the public. You ever see this movie, Seven Days in May, uh, Kirk Douglas and Burt Lancaster, about an attempted military takeover of the United States of America, was based loosely on this story. But, of course, in the movie, the, the bankers being behind the Burt Lancaster character was completely removed from the script here. Now, Smedley Butler is also famous for writing a work called War is a Racket, and I would like to read you a quote from that. Quote, I spent 33 years and four months in active military service as a member of our country's most agile military force, the Marine Corps. I served in all commissioned ranks from second lieutenant to major general. And during that period, I spent more of my time being a high-class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street, and for the bankers. In short, I was a racketeer, a gangster for capitalism. I suspected I was just part of a racket at the time. Now I'm sure of it. Like all members of the military profession, I never had an original thought until after I left the service. My mental faculties remained in suspended animation while I obeyed the orders of the higher-ups. This is typical with everyone in the military service. 
Thus, I helped make Mexico and especially Tampico safe for American oil interests in 1914. I helped make Haiti and Cuba a decent place for the National City Bank boys to collect revenues in. I helped in the raping of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefit of Wall Street. The record of racketeering is long. I helped purify Nicaragua for the International Banking House of Brown Brothers in 1909 through 1912. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for American sugar interests in 1916. In China in 1927, I helped see to it that the Standard Oil went its way unmolested. During those years, I had, as the boys in the back room would say, a swell racket. I was rewarded with honors, medals, and promotion. Looking back on it, I feel I might have given Al Capone a few hints. The best he could do was operate his racket in three city districts. I operated on three continents. General Smedley Butler, former U.S. Marine Corps Commandant, and he wrote that in 1935. So, Now, moving forward here. As president... John Fitzgerald Kennedy understood the predatory nature of private central banking. He understood why Andrew Jackson fought so hard to end the Second Bank of the United States. So Kennedy wrote and signed Executive Order 11110, which ordered the U.S. Treasury to issue a new public currency called the United States Note. Now, Kennedy's United States notes were not borrowed from the Federal Reserve. They were created by the U.S. government and backed by the silver stockpiles held by the U.S. government. It represented a return to the system of economics the United States had been founded on, and it was perfectly legal for Kennedy to do so under the Constitution. All told, some $4.5 billion went into the public circulation, which eroded interest payments to the Federal Reserve and loosened their control over the nation. Five months after signing Executive Order 11110, John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas, and the United States notes pulled from circulation and destroyed. Following Kennedy's assassination, John J. McCloy, President of the Chase Manhattan Bank and President of the World Bank was named to the Warren Commission. Now, I don't care how good a banker he is, he's not qualified to be investigating a a murder, which is what we were told the Warren Commission was all about, to get the truth of the assassination. But we all know that the Warren Commission was there to cover up what was going on, and obviously we can presume safely that John J. McCloy's presence on the Warren Commission was to make sure the American public never got even a hint of the financial dimensions behind the assassination. So, as we enter the 11th year of what I am certain future history will most certainly describe as World War III, we need to examine the financial dimensions behind all these wars. Why are we here? Why are our children being killed and crippled? Is this another war for the profit of the private central bankers? And the answer is yes. Now, toward the end of World War II, when it became obvious that the Allies were going to win and dictate the post-war political environment, the major world economic powers met at Bretton Woods, a luxury resort in New Hampshire, in July of 1944, and they hammered out the Bretton Woods Agreement for International Finance. The British pound lost its position as the global trade and reserve currency to the U.S. dollar. There are indications this was part of the price demanded by Roosevelt in exchange for the U.S. entry into the war. Now, absent the economic advantages of being the world's go-to currency, Britain was forced to nationalize their Bank of England in 1946. The Bretton Woods Agreement, ratified in 1945, in addition to making the dollar the global reserve and trade currency, obligated the signatory nations to tie their currencies to the dollar. The nations that ratified Bretton Woods did so on two conditions. The first was that the Federal Reserve would refrain from overprinting the dollar, uh, basically as a means to loot real products and produce from other nations in exchange for ink and paper. It basically was an imperial tax imposed by the U.S. economic system on the rest of the world. That assurance of no overprinting was supposedly backed up by the second requirement, which was that the U.S. dollar would always be convertible back to gold by the U.S. government at $35 an ounce. Now, of course, the Federal Reserve being a private bank and not answerable to the U.S. government, did in fact start overprinting paper dollars, which were sent to other nations around the world, and under Bretton Woods, they had to send back products and produce and and raw materials at full value. And much of the perceived American prosperity of the 1950s and 60s was the result of these foreign nations having to send real raw materials, goods, produce, back to the United States in exchange for the, these little pieces of paper with ink all over them, because they were forced to accept these paper notes as being worth $35 per ounce of gold. Then in 1970, France started looking at this huge pile of printed paper notes sitting in their bank vaults, 
for which real French products like wine and cheese had been traded, and it notified the United States government that they would exercise their option under Bretton Woods to return all those paper notes for gold at the agreed-upon $35 per ounce ex- exchange rate. The problem was the United States had nowhere near the goal to redeem all those paper notes. So on August 15, 1971, Richard Nixon temporarily, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, say no more, suspended gold convertibility of the U.S. Federal Reserve notes. This Nixon shock, as it was termed at the time, effectively ended Bretton Woods, and many global currencies started to delink from the U.S. dollar. And it created another problem, because the United States had been collateralizing their loans, money borrowed from other governments and uh, foreign investors, with the American nation's gold reserves. And with the awareness that there wasn't enough gold to redeem all the Federal Reserve notes, lenders to the U.S. were starting to wonder, did the U.S. government have enough gold to cover, collateralize their outstanding debts? Foreign nations began to get very nervous about the loans uh, to the United States, and they were understandably reluctant to loan any additional money without some form of collateral. So what Richard Nixon did is he founded the environmental movement with the EPA and its various programs like wilderness zones and roadless areas and heritage rivers, wetlands, and all these other little different programs which all took vast areas of public lands and made them off-limits to the American people, who are technically the owner of all those lands. But Nixon had no concern for the environment, and the real purpose of this land grab, under the guise of the environment, was to pledge those pristine lands and their vast mineral resources as collateral on the outstanding national debt. The multitude of all these different programs was simply to conceal the scale of the land grab and collateralization of the American people's heritage. And it actually today covers almost 25% of the entire nation, is now locked up by these EPA programs and pledged as collateral on government borrowing. Now, with open lands, available lands for collateralization already in short supply, the U.S. government embarked on a new program to shore up sagging international demand for the dollar. The United States approached the world's oil-producing nations, mostly in the Middle East, and offered them a deal. In exchange for only selling their oil for dollars, the United States would guarantee the military safety of those oil-rich nations. The oil-rich nations would agree to spend and invest their U.S. paper dollars inside the United States, particularly in U.S. Treasury bonds, which would be redeemable through future generations of U.S. taxpayers. The concept was labeled the petrodollar. In effect, the United States, no longer able to back the dollar with gold, was now backing it with oil, other people's oil. And that necessity to keep control over those oil nations to prop up the dollar has dominated America's foreign policy in the region ever since. But as America's manufacturing and agriculture has declined, the oil-producing nations faced a dilemma. Like France, they've got piles and piles of these paper notes and treasury bonds piling up in in their vaults, and there really wasn't all that much except real estate they wanted to buy from the United States of America. Europe's cars and aircraft were superior and less costly. In more recent times, America's experiment with GMO food crops has led a lot of nations to simply avoid buying U.S. agricultural exports. Israel's constant belligerence against its neighbors has caused the oil-producing nations to wonder if the U.S. could actually keep their end of the petrodollar arrangement. So oil-producing nations started to talk of selling their oil for whatever currency the purchasers wanted to pay. Iraq, already somewhat hostile to the United States following Desert Storm, demanded the right to sell their oil for euros in 2000. In 2002, the United Nations agreed that Iraq had a right to sell their oil for euros under the Oil for Food program. One year later, 2003, the United States reinvaded Iraq, lynched Saddam Hussein, and placed Iraq's oil back on the world market, only available for U.S. dollars. Now, the clear U.S. policy shift following 9-11, away from at least attempting to appear to be an impartial broker of peace in the Mideast, to one of unquestioned support for Israel's aggressions, only further eroded confidence in the petrodollar deal, and even more oil-producing nations started openly talking of trading their oil for other global currencies. So over in Libya, Muammar Gaddafi had instituted a state central bank and a value-based trade currency, the gold dinar. Qaddafi then announced that Libya's oil was for sale, but only for the gold dinar. Other African nations seeing the rise of the gold dinar and the euro, even as the U.S. dollar continued its inflation-driven decline, flocked to the new Libyan currency for trade. 
This move had the potential to seriously undermine the global hegemony of the dollar. French President Nicolas Sarkozy reportedly went so far as to call Libya a threat to the financial security of the world. So the United States invaded Libya under the, the guise of supporting a popular rebellion. They brutally murdered Gaddafi, apparently because the object lesson of Saddam's lynching had not been enough of a message, imposed a private central bank, and returned Libya's oil output to dollars only. The gold that was uh, supposed to be made into the gold dinars, as of the last report I could find, unaccounted for. Now, according to General Wesley Clark, the master plan for the dollarification of the world's oil nations included seven targets. Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and Iran. Venezuela, which has started selling their oil to China for the yuan, seems to be a late addition. What is notable about those original seven nations targeted by the U.S. is that none of them are members of the Bank of International Settlements. This is the private central banker's private central bank located in Switzerland. That meant that those seven targeted nations were deciding for themselves how to run their nation's economies rather than submitting to the international private central bankers. Now, of course, the bankers' gun sites are on Iran, which dares to have a government central bank and sell their oil for whatever currency they choose. The war agenda for Iran is, all, as always, to force Iran's oil to be sold only for dollars and to force them to accept a privately owned central bank. Now, you have been raised by a public school system and a media that constantly assures you that the reasons for all these wars and assassinations are many and varied. We're bringing democracy to the conquered lands. We hear that a lot. When actually, the U.S. hasn't. The usual result of a U.S. overthrow is the imposition of a pro-business, pro-Wall Street, pro-U.S. dictatorship. Good example, the 1953 CIA overthrow of Iran's democratically elected government of Mohammad Mossadegh and the imposition of the Shah. Or the 1973 CIA overthrow of Chile's elected government of President Salvador Allende and the imposition of the dictator Augusto Pinochet. Another one of the excuses we'll get is, we have to save the people from a cruel oppressor. That's the one they're using in Syria right now. Revenge for 9-11. That was a big one going into Iraq. And then later on, President Bush was caught on video saying, no, Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. And behind all of them, that tired, worn-out, catch-all excuse for invasion, weapons of mass destruction. Assassinations are always passed off as crazed, lone nuts to obscure the real agenda. And the real agenda of the bankers is very simple. It is enslavement of the people by creation of a false sense of obligation. Now, that obligation is false because the private central banking system, by design, creates more debt than money with which to pay the debt. There is no way out the way it's set up. It's impossible to escape as long as you're playing by their rules. And you need to understand, private central banking is not science. It is a religion. It's a set of arbitrary rules created to benefit the priesthood, meaning the bankers, and it is supported only because people believe this is the way it's supposed to be. It is a religion. It's a set of arbitrary rules created to benefit the priesthood, meaning the owners of the private central banks. The fraud persists with often lethal results only because the people are brainwashed into believing that this is the way life is supposed to be, and no alternative exists or should even be dreamt of. Now this same approach the same brainwashing was true of two earlier systems of enslavement, rule by divine right and slavery, both systems built to trick people into obedience and both now recognized by modern civilization as illegitimate. So now we are on the verge of a new era in history where we will recognize that rule by debt, rule by private central bankers issuing the public currency as a loan at interest is equally illegitimate. It only works as long as people allow themselves to believe that this is the way life is supposed to be. But you need to understand something that's the core of the issue. Private central banks do not exist to serve the people, the community, or the nation. Private central banks exist to serve their owners, to make them rich beyond the dreams of Midas, and all for the cost of ink, paper, and the right bribe to the right official, and the occasional assassination. But behind all these wars and all these assassinations, the hundred million plus horrible deaths from all of these wars lies a single policy of financial dictatorship. The private central bankers only allow rulers to rule, only on the promise that the people of a nation be enslaved to the private central banks. Rulers who do not go along 
with that will be killed. Their nation invaded by those other nations still enslaved to the private central banks. The bankers themselves don't fight these wars. Their children are not in these wars. A nation tries to break free of the private central bankers like Libya. All the other nations under the bankers' control pile on and destroy them. This so-called clash of civilizations you are being told about by the corporate media, it's a really a war between banking systems, with the private central bankers forcing themselves onto the rest of the world, no matter how many millions must die for it. The constant hate-mongering against Muslims you see in the corporate media lies in a simple fact. Like the ancient Christians prior to the Knights Templars, Muslims forbid usury or the lending of money at interest because they saw in ancient times, like Rome, how these banking practices could destroy an entire society. And that is the reason our government media insists that Muslims have to be hated and killed and converted. They refuse to submit to currencies loaned at interest. They refuse to be debt slaves. That makes them a threat to the natural order of the world, the new world order of global fascist dictatorship. So, off to war your children must go to spill their blood for the money junkies gold. We barely survived the last two world wars. Now we're going into the third one in the nuclear bioweapon age. That is very dangerous. We have to ask ourselves, are the private central bankers willing to risk incinerating the whole planet to feed their greed? Apparently so. You as parents, as siblings, as spouses, need to ask yourself, do you really want to see your loved ones in uniform, killed and crippled, all for a bank balance sheet? But the whole point of this article, the whole point of what I am sharing with you today, and this is all history, you can go out and hunt it down for yourself. Behind all the flag waving, behind all the propaganda, behind the crazed, lone nut assassins, weapons of mass destruction, all of the modern wars this nation have fought are wars by and for the private bankers fought and bled for by third parties unaware of the true reason they're expected to gracefully accept being killed and crippled for. And the process is quite simple. We've explained it before on this show. As soon as the private central bank issues its currency as a loan at interest, the public is forced deeper and deeper into debt. When the people are reluctant to borrow anymore, that's when the Keynesian economists demand the government borrow more to keep the pyramid scheme working. When both the people and the government refuse to borrow anymore, that is when the large wars get started. To plunge everyone, even deeper to debt to pay for the war and then after the war to e borrow even more to rebuild and when these horrible wars are over the ordinary people have basically what they had before the war except their graveyards are a lot larger and everyone is in debt to the private bankers for the next century that is why brown brothers Herman in new york was funding the rise of adolf hitler because war is the bankers richest harvest we all need to recognize this is what all these wars have been about private central banking, enlarging their domain, imposing their will on nations that do not want it, imposing their system on the rulers of nations who do not want it. Bribery, blackmail, assassination, they will do anything to maintain their stranglehold on the productivity of the world's people. And as long as private central banks are allowed to exist, inevitably, as the night follows the day, there will be poverty, hopelessness, millions of deaths in endless world wars until the earth itself is sacrificed in flames to mammon. The path to true world peace lies in the abolishment of all private central banking everywhere and a return to the state-issued value-based currencies that allow nations and people to become prosperous through their own labor and development and efforts. Now, I mentioned the Knights Templars. <clears throat> Prior to the Knights Templars, Christianity, like Islam, forbade usury because Christianity, much of Orthodox Christianity, came out of Rome and they had seen firsthand what debt-based economies do, even to the Roman Empire. They'd seen it firsthand, so they had a ban on usury. And the Knights Templars were able to basically either bribe or blackmail the Pope to get a special dispensation that allowed them to, to rent money, is what they called it. They didn't call it usury, they called it renting money. A lot of modern predatory banking practices were pioneered by the Knights Templars. And they plunged Europe into hopelessly unpayable debt until finally French King Philip IV, otherwise known as Philip the Fair, came, did the only solution he could do. Because he understood as long as you believed in the rules of the bankers, as long as you played by the rules they created to serve themselves, you are hopelessly trapped. And so Philip thought outside the box, and I know he's demonized for it, but in looking at the history of the Templars, I, it was his last resort. He sent messages to all of the regions uh, in France, secret orders on the same time, in the same moment, on the same day, all of the Templars were arrested. 
and their commanderies, which is what they called their banks, were broken into, looking for uh, looted wealth. They didn't find a lot of it. It was all it was a pa- it was a paper empire, just like the Federal Reserve is. It's all based on paper. There's no nothing of any real value there. It's all paper notes. And he sent the Templars to prison and execution, except for Scotland and Portugal, where the Pope and King Philip IV really didn't have a lot of control. I think that the governments of the world, looking at the situation, looking how close we are to seeing this current world conflict emerge into a full-blown global thermonuclear war, that maybe they need to start thinking about the wisdom of King Philip the Fair and say it's time to simply grab all these private central bankers all at the same time so they can't simply skedaddle from one nation to another and come back and, and try the same thing again as they will inevitably do, because these people are addicts. They're hopelessly addicted to other people's money. That's why we call them money junkies. When we see somebody who's, who's addicted to cocaine or methamphetamine or heroin, and we can easily see how they're destroying their home and community around them. Now we need to look at these money addicts and look at how they're destroying the entire world around them. And it's time for an intervention. It's time for us to become private central banking heretics, to stop believing that this is the way life is supposed to be, because it isn't. It isn't even the way the United States was actually started. And they're trying as hard. Look at the destruction of our nation. We used to be the world's greatest nation. Now the most generous estimate is we're down to number 16 and still falling. And yet, despite the destruction to our nation, its infrastructure, its children, its quality of medical care, the quality of its, of its manufacturing output, we still are compelled somehow to go out and force this same banking system onto the rest of the world at the point of a bayonet. Does that make any sense at all? Not to a rational human being. To a money junkie, yeah, it's perfect. But we're really at a crisis point in history. And the first step to resolving that crisis, to not let it go any further into a potential nuclear war, is to recognize that private central banking, ruled by manufactured illusion of debt, is no more legitimate a system of governance than ruled by divine right or ruled by slavery. We all need to recognize the true cause of all the pain and suffering in wars. It's not the terrorists. It's not Al-Qaeda. These are just distractions and set pieces put in front of your eyes so you can't see the very clear pattern behind much of modern human history. It's a war of banking systems with the predatory private central banks seeking to eradicate any nation and any ruler that would dare try and operate their economy outside the control of the private central bankers. That's the real cause for the war. Is it something you're willing to fight and die for to support these private central bankers? Is it something you're willing to let your sons and daughters and brothers and sisters be blown to bloody bits for so the money junkies can have their latest fix, just a little tiny bit more gold or a little larger number on the bottom of that brokerage statement so they can have today's thrill, their fix, their fix of money that is bought with the blood of your children? I don't think so. But the time has come to point out what really is the cause of all causes behind all the wars and suffering that our planet is having to endure and our people are having to endure. The common enemy of all humankind are private central banks issuing the public currency as a loan at interest. And as history will show, they will do anything up to and including global wars to keep their lock on yours and your children's future economic well-being and productivity. We're not a free society. Media will tell us that we're free, but we're not free. We are slaves. Our slave chains are made of paper, and that paper is the Federal Reserve note. Too few of our leaders have tried to stand up to this system of enslavement, usually with lethal results. But if all the people of the world at the same time stand up and say no more private central banks, it will come crashing down, just as slavery did, just as rule by divine right did, and then we'll be embarking on a new era in human history where the emphasis on social development is on the people and not on the money junkies.